Chapter six of In the Mayor's Parlour by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ancient Office of a Coroner. The discovery of Wallingford's will, which lay uppermost amongst a small collection of private papers in a drawer of the dead man's desk, led Brent and Tansley into a new train of thought. Tansley, with the ready perception and acumen of a man trained in the law, was quick to point out two or three matters which in the view of Wallingford's murder seemed to be of high importance, perhaps of deep significance. Appended to the will was a schedule of the testator's properties and possessions, with the total value of the estate estimated and given in precise figures. That was how Brent suddenly became aware that he had come into a small fortune. Then the will itself was in holograph, written out in Wallingford's own hand on a single sheet of paper, in the briefest possible fashion, and witnessed by his two clerks, and most important and significant of all, it had been executed only a week previously. "'Do you know how that strikes me?' observed Tansley in a low voice, as if he feared to be overheard. "'It just looks to me as if Wallingford had anticipated that something was about to happen.' Had he ever given you any idea in his letters that he was going to do this? Never, replied Brent. Still, I'm the only very near relative that he had. Well, said Tansley, it may be mere coincidence, but it's a bit odd that he should be murdered within a week of that will's being made. I'd just like to know if he'd been threatened, openly, anonymously, anyway. Looks like it. I suppose we shall get into things at the inquest, asked Brent. Tansley shrugged his shoulders. "'Maybe,' he answered. "'I've no great faith in inquests myself. But sometimes things do come out, and our coroner Seagrave is a painstaking and thoroughgoing sort of old chap, the leading solicitor in the town, too. But it all depends on what evidence can be brought forward. I've always an uneasy feeling, as regards a coroner's inquiry, that the very people who really could tell something never come forward.' "'Doesn't that look as if such people were keeping something back that would incriminate themselves?' suggested Brent. "'Not necessarily,' replied Tansley. "'But it often means that it might incriminate others. "'And in an old town like this, where the folk are very clannish and closely connected one with another by literally centuries of intermarriage between families, you're not going to get one man to give another away.' "'You think that even if the murderer is known, or if someone suspected, he would be shielded?' asked Brent. "'In certain eventualities, yes,' answered Tansley. "'We all know that rumours about your cousin's murder are afloat in the town now, and spreading. Well, the more they spread, the closer and more secretive will those people become who are in the know. That is, of course, if anybody is in the know. That's a fact.' "'What do you think yourself?' said Brent suddenly. "'Come now.' "'I think the mayor was got rid of, and very cleverly,' replied Tansley. "'So cleverly that I'm doubtful if tomorrow's inquest will have revealed anything. However, it's got to be held.' "'Well, you'll watch it for me,' said Brent. "'I'm going to spare no expense and no pains to get at the truth.' He sat at Tansley's side when the inquest was opened next morning, in the principal court of the old Moot Hall. It struck him as rather a curious fact that although he had followed the profession of journalist for several years, he had never until then been present at the holding of this, one of the most ancient forms of inquiry known to English law. But he was familiar with the history of the thing. He knew that ever since the days of Edward the Fourth, the coroner had held his sitting, super visum corporis, with the aid of at least twelve jurymen, probi et legales homines. There was scarcely in all the range of English legal economy an office more ancient. He inspected the coroner and his jury with curious interest. Seagrave, coroner of the honour of Hathelsborough, was a keen-faced old lawyer, whose astute looks were relieved by a kindly expression. His twelve good men and true were tradesmen of the town, whose exterior promised a variety of character and temperament from the sharply alert to the dully unimaginative. There were other people there in whom Brent was speedily interested, 
and at whom he gazed with speculative attention in the opening stages of the proceedings. The court was crowded. By the time Seagrave, as coroner, took his seat, there was not a square foot of even standing space. Brent recognized a good many folk. There was Peppermore with his sharp-eyed boy assistant. There, ranged alongside of them, were many other reporters from the various county newspapers, and at least one man whom Brent recognized as being from the Press Association in London. And there was a big array of police, with Hawthwaite at its head, and there were doctors and officials of the Moot Hall, and amongst the general public many men whom Brent remembered seeing the previous day in Bull's Snug. Crevin Crude was among these, in a privileged seat, not far away sat his brother the alderman, with Queenie half hidden at his side, and his satellites, Mallet and Coppinger, in close attendance. And near them, in another privileged place, sat a very pretty woman of a distinct and superior type, attired in semi-mourning, and accompanied by her elderly female companion. Brent was looking at these two when Tansley nudged his elbow. "'You see that handsome woman over there, next to the older one?' he whispered. "'That's the Mrs. Somares you've heard of, that your unfortunate cousin was very friendly with. Rich young widow she is, and deuced pretty and attractive. Wallingford used to dine with her a good deal. I wonder if she's any ideas about this mystery? However, I guess we shall hear many things before the day's out, and of course I haven't the slightest notion what evidence is going to be given.' but I've a pretty good idea that Seagrave means to say some pretty straight things to the jury. Here Tansley proved to be right. The coroner, in opening the proceedings, made some forcible remarks on their unusual gravity and importance. Here was a case in which the chief magistrate of one of the most ancient boroughs in England had been found dead in his official room under circumstances which clearly seemed to point to murder. Already there were rumours in the town and neighbourhood of the darkest and most disgraceful sort, that the mayor of Hathelsborough had been done to death, in a peculiarly brutal fashion, by a man or men who disagreed with the municipal reforms which he was intent on carrying out. It would be a lasting and indelible blot on the old town's fair fame, never tarnished before in this way, if this inquiry came to naught if no definite verdict was given he earnestly hoped that by the time it concluded they would be in possession of facts which would so to speak clear the town and any political party in the town he begged them to give the closest attention to all that would be put before them and to keep open minds until they heard all the available evidence a fairly easy matter in this particular case muttered tansley as the jurymen went out to discharge their distasteful preliminary task of viewing the body of the murdered man i don't suppose there's a single man there who has the ghost of a theory and i'm doubtful if he'll know much more to-night than he knows now unless something startling is sprung upon us brent was the first witness called into the box when the court settled down to its business he formally identified the body of the deceased as that of his cousin, John Wallingford, at the time of his death, mayor of Hathelsborough, and forty-one years of age. He detailed the particulars of his own coming to the town on the evening of the murder, and told how he and Bunning, going upstairs to the mayor's parlour, had found Wallingford lying across his desk, dead. All this every man and woman in the court knew already, but the coroner desired to know more. "'I believe, Mr. Brent,' he said, when the witness had given these particulars, "'that you are the deceased's nearest blood relative?' "'I am,' replied Dent. "'Then you can give us some information which may be of use. "'Although the mayor had lived in Hathelsborough some twelve years or so, "'he was neither a native of the town nor of these parts. "'Now, can you give us some particulars about him, "'about his family and his life, before he came to this borough?' "'Yes,' said Brent. "'My cousin was the only son, only child, in fact, "'of the Reverend Septimus Wallingford, "'who was sometime vicar of Market Meadow in Berkshire. "'He is dead, many years ago. "'So is his wife. "'My cousin was educated at Reading Grammar School, "'and on leaving it he was articled to a firm of solicitors in that town. 
After qualifying as a solicitor, he remained with the firm for some time. About twelve years ago he came to this place as managing clerk to a Hathelsborough firm. Its partners eventually retired, and he bought their practice. Was he ever married? Never. You knew him well? He was some twelve years my senior, answered Brent, so I was a mere boy when he was a young man. But of late years we have seen a good deal of each other. He has frequently visited me in London, and this would have been my third visit to him here. We corresponded regularly. You were on good terms? We were on very good terms. And confidential terms? As far as I know, yes. He took great interest in my work as a journalist, and I took great interest in his career in this town. And I understand that he has marked his sense of, shall we say, kinship for you, by leaving you all his property? He has. Now, did he ever say anything to you, by word of mouth or letter, about any private troubles? No, never. Or about any public ones? Well, some months ago, soon after he became mayor of Hathelsborough, he made a sort of joking reference in a letter to something that might come under that head. Yes? What now? He said that he had started on his task of cleaning out the Augean stable of Hathelsborough, and that the old task of Hercules was child's play compared to his. I believe, Mr. Brent, that you visited your cousin here in the town about Christmas last. Did he say anything to you about Hathelsborough at that time? I mean, as regards what he called his Augean stables task? Brent hesitated. He glanced at the eagerly listening spectators, and he smiled a little. Well, he replied half-hesitatingly, he did. He said that in his opinion Hathelsborough was the rottenest and most corrupt little town in all England. Did you take that as a seriously meant statement, Mr. Brent? Oh, well, he laughed as he made it. I took it as a specimen of his rather heightened way of putting things. Did he say anything that led you to think that he believed himself to have bitter enemies in the town? No, said Brent, he did not. Neither then nor at any other time? Neither then nor at any other time. The coroner asked no further questions, and Brent sat down again by Tansley, and settled himself to consider whatever evidence might follow. He tried to imagine himself a coroner or juryman, and to estimate and weigh the testimony of each succeeding witness in its relation to the matter into which the court was inquiring. Some of it, he thought, was relevant, some had little in it that carried affairs any further. Yet he began to see that even the apparently irrelevant evidence was not without its importance. There were links, these statements, these answers, links that went to the making of a chain. He was already familiar with most of the evidence, he knew what each witness was likely to tell before one or other entered the box. Bunning came next after himself. Bunning had nothing new to tell, nor was there anything new in the medical evidence given by Dr. Wellesley and Dr. Barber. All the town knew how the mayor had been murdered, and the purely scientific explanations as to the cause of death were merely details. More interest came when Hawthwaite produced the fragment of handkerchief picked up on the hearth of the mayor's parlour, half burnt, and when he brought forward the rapier which had been discovered behind the bookcase, still more when a man who kept an old curiosity shop in a back street of the town proved that he had sold the rapier to Wallingford only a few days before the murder. But interest died down again while the borough surveyor produced elaborate plans and diagrams illustrating the various corridors, passages, entrances and exits of the Moot Hall, with a view to showing the difficulty of access to the mayor's parlour. It revived once more when the policeman, who had been on duty at the office of the basement, stepped into the box and was questioned as to the possibilities of entrance to the Moot Hall through the door near which his desk was posted. For on pressure by the coroner, he admitted that between six and eight o'clock, on the fateful evening he had twice been absent from the neighbourhood of that door for intervals of five or six minutes. It was therefore possible that the murderer had slipped in and slipped out without attracting attention. 
This admission produced the first element of distinct sensation which had so far materialized. As almost every person present was already fairly well acquainted with the details of what had transpired on the evening of the murder, Peppermore having published every scrap of information he could rake up in successive editions of his monitor, the constable's belated revelation came as a surprise. Hawthwaite turned on the witness with an irate, astonished look. The coroner glanced at Hawthwaite as if he were puzzled, then looked down at certain memoranda lying before him. He turned from this to the witness, a somewhat raw, youthful policeman. "'I understood that you were never away from that door between six and eight o'clock on the evening in question,' he said. "'Now you admit that you were twice away from it?' "'Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I clean forgot that when—' When the superintendent asked me at first, I, I, I was a bit flustered, like. Now, let us get a clear statement about this, said the coroner, after a pause. We know quite well from the plans and from our own knowledge that anyone could get up to the mayor's parlour through the police office in the basement at the rear of the boot hall. What time did you go on duty at the door that opens into the office from St. Lawrence Lane? Six o'clock, sir. "'And you were about the door, at a desk there, eh? Until when?' "'Till after eight, sir.' "'But you say you were absent for a short time twice?' "'Yes, sir, I remember now that I was.' "'What were the times of those two absences?' "'Well, sir, about ten minutes to seven, I went along to the charge office for a few minutes, five or six minutes. Then, at about quarter to eight, I went downstairs into the cellar to get some paraffin for a lamp.' I might be away as long then, sir. And, of course, during your absence anybody could have left or entered unnoticed? Well, they could, sir, but I don't think anybody did. Why now? Because, sir, the door opening into St. Lawrence Lane is a very heavy one, and I never heard it either open or close. The latch is a heavy one, too, sir, and uncommon stiff. Still, anybody might, observed the coroner, now, what is the length of the passage between that door, the door at the foot of the stairs leading to this court, by which anybody would have to come to get that way to the mayor's parlour? The witness reflected for a moment. Well, about ten yards, sir, he answered. The coroner looked at the plan which the borough surveyor had placed before him and the jury a few minutes previously. Before he could say anything further, Hawthwaite rose from his seat, and making his way to him exchanged a few whispered remarks with him. Presently the coroner nodded, as if in assent to some suggestion. "'Oh, very well,' he said. "'Then perhaps we'd better have her at once. Call—what's her name, did you say? Oh, yes, Sarah Jane Spicey.' From amidst a heterogeneous collection of folk, men and women, congregated at the rear of the witness-box, a woman came forward, one of the most extraordinary-looking creatures that he had ever seen, thought Brent. She was nearly six feet in height, she was correspondingly built, her arms appeared to be as brawny as a navvy's, her face was of the shape and roundness of a full moon, her mouth was a wide slit, her nose a button, her eyes were as shrewd and hard as they were small and close-set, a very grenadier of a woman and apparently quite unmoved by the knowledge that everybody was staring at her. Sarah Jane Spicey, yes, wife of the town bellman, resident in St. Lawrence Lane, went out charring sometimes, sometimes worked at Mariner's Laundry, odd job woman, in fact. Mrs. Spicey, said the coroner, I understand that on the evening of Mr. Wallingford's death you were engaged in some work in the Moot Hall. Is that so? Yes, sir which I was a-washing the floor of this very court. What time was that, Mrs. Spicey? Which I was at it, your worshipful, from six o'clock to eight. Did you leave this place at all during that time? Not once, sir, not for a minute. Now, during the whole of that time, Mrs. Spicey, did you see anybody come up those stairs, cross the court, and go towards the mayor's parlour? which I never did, sir. I never see a soul of any sort, which the place was empty, sir, for all but me and my work, sir. The coroner motioned Mrs. Spicey to stand down, and glanced at Hawthwaite. 
i think this would be a convenient point at which to adjourn he said i but hawthwaite's eyes were turned elsewhere in the body of the court an elderly man had risen end of chapter six chapter seven of in the mayor's parlour by j s fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain the voluntary witness everybody present not excluding brent knew the man at whom the superintendent of police was staring and who evidently wished to address the coroner he was mr samuel john epplewhite an elderly highly respectable tradesman of the town and closely associated with that forward party in the town council of which the late mayor had become the acknowledged leader a man of substance and repute who would not break in without serious reason upon proceedings of the sort then going on the coroner following hawthwaite's glance nodded to him you wish to make some observation mr epplewhite he inquired before you adjourn sir if you please replied epplewhite i should like to make a statement evidence in fact sir i think after what we've heard that it's highly necessary that i should certainly answered the coroner anything you can tell of course then perhaps you'll step into the witness box the folk who crowded the court to its very doors looked on impatiently while epplewhite went through the legal formalities laying down the testament on which he had taken the oath he turned to the coroner but the coroner again nodded to him you had better tell us what is in your mind in your own way mr epplewhite he said we are of course in utter ignorance of what it is you can tell put it in your own fashion epplewhite folded his hands on the ledge of the witness box and looked around the court before finally settling his eyes on the coroner it seemed to brent as if he were carefully considering the composition severally and collectively of his audience well sir he began in slow measured accents what i have to say as briefly as i can is this everybody here i believe is aware that our late mayor and myself were on particularly friendly terms we'd always been more or less of friends since his first coming to the town we'd similar tastes and interests but our friendship had been on an even more intimate basis during the last year or two and especially of recent months owing no doubt to the fact that we belonged to the same party on the town council and were both equally anxious to bring about a thorough reform in municipal administration of the borough when mr wallingford was elected mayor last november he and i and our supporters on the council resolved that during his year of office we would do our best to sweep away certain crying abuses and generally get the affairs of hathelsborough placed on a more modern and a better footing we were all the coroner held up his hand let us have a clear understanding he said i am gathering officially of course from what you are saying that in hathelsborough town council there are two parties opposed to each other a party pledged to reform and another that is opposed to reform is that so mr epplewhite precisely so answered the witness and of the reform party the late mayor was the leader this is well known in the town it's a matter of common gossip it is also well known to members of the town council that mr wallingford's proposals for reform were of a very serious and drastic nature that we of his party were going to support them through thick and thin and that they were bitterly opposed by the other party whose members were resolved to fight them tooth and nail it may be as well to know what these abuses were which you propose to reform suggested the coroner i want to get a thorough clearing up of everything well responded the witness with another glance around the court the late mayor had a rooted and particular objection to the system of payments and pensions in force at present which without doubt owes its existence to favouritism and jobbery there are numerous people in the town drawing money from the borough funds who have no right to it on any ground whatever there are others who draw salaries for what are really sinecures a great deal of the ratepayers money has gone in this way men in high places in the corporation 
have used their power to benefit relations and favourites. I question if there's another town in the country in which such a state of things would be permitted. But there is a more serious matter than that, one which Mr. Wallingford was absolutely determined, with the help of his party, and backed by public opinion, if he could win it over. No easy thing, for we have had centuries of usage and tradition against us, to bring to an end. That is the fact that the financial affairs of this town are entirely controlled by what is virtually a self-constituted body called the town trustees. They are three in number. If one dies, the surviving two select his successor. Needless to say, they took good care that they choose a man who is in thorough sympathy with their own ideas. Now, the late mayor was convinced that this system led to nothing but, well, to put it mildly, to nothing but highly undesirable results, and he claimed that the corporation had the right to deprive the existing town trustees of their power, and to take into its own hands the full administration of the borough finances. And, of course, there was much bitter animosity aroused by this proposal, because the town trustees have had a free hand and done what they liked with the town's money for a couple of centuries. The coroner, who was making elaborate notes, lifted his pen. "'Who are the town trustees at present, Mr. Epplewhite?' he inquired. Epplewhite smiled, as a man might smile who knows that a question is only asked as a mere formality. "'The town trustees at present, sir,' he answered quietly, "'are Mr. Alderman Crood, Deputy Mayor, Mr. Councillor Mallet, Borough Auditor, and Mr. Councillor Coppinger, Borough Treasurer.' Amidst a curious silence, broken only by the scratching of the coroner's pen, Alderman Crood rose heavily in his place amongst the spectators. "'Mr. Coroner,' he said, with some show of injured feeling, "'I object, sir, to my name being mentioned in connection with this here matter. You're inquiring, sir?' "'I'm inquiring, Mr. Crood, into the circumstances surrounding the death of John Wallingford,' said the coroner. "'If you can throw any light on them, I shall be glad to take your evidence. At present I am taking the evidence of another witness.' "'Yes, Mr. Applewhite?' "'Well, sir, I come to recent events,' continued Applewhite, smiling grimly as the deputy mayor, flushed and indignant, resumed his seat. The late mayor was very well aware that his proposals were regarded not merely with great dislike, but with positive enmity. He, and those of us who agreed with him, were constantly asked in the council chamber what right we had to be endeavouring to interfere with a system that had suited our fathers and grandfathers. We were warned, too, in the council chamber, that we should get ourselves into trouble. "'Do you refer to actual threats?' asked the coroner. "'Scarcely that, sir. Hints and so on,' replied the witness. "'But of late, in the case of the late mayor, actual threats have been used. And to bring my evidence to a point, Mr. Coroner, I now wish to make a certain statement on my oath and to produce a certain piece of evidence to show that Mr. Wallingford's personal safety was threatened only a few days before his murder. Thus saying, Epplewhite thrust a hand into the inner pocket of his coat, and producing a letter, held it out at arm's length so that every one could see it. So holding it, he turned to the coroner. "'It is just a week ago, sir,' he proceeded, "'that Mr. Wallingford came to supper at my house.' After supper, he and I, being alone, began talking about the subject which was uppermost in our minds, municipal reform. That day I had had considerable talk with two or three fellow members of the council who belonged to the opposite party, and as a result I showed to Wallingford that opposition to our plans was growing more concentrated, determined, and bitter. He laughed a little satirically. "'It's gone beyond even that stage with me, personally, Epplewhite,' he said. "'Don't you ever be surprised, my friend, if you hear of my being found with a bullet through my head or a knife between my ribs.' "'What do you mean?' said I. "'Nonsense.' He laughed again and pulled out this envelope. "'All right,' he answered. "'You read that.' I read what was in the envelope, sir, and now I pass it to you." The coroner silently took the letter which was passed across to him from the witness, 
withdrew a sheet of paper from it and read the contents with an inscrutable face and amidst a dead silence it seemed a long time before he turned to the jury then he held up the sheet of paper and the envelope which had contained it gentlemen he said i shall have to draw your particular attention to this matter this is an anonymous letter from the date on the postmark it was received by the late mayor about a week before he showed it to mr epplewhite it is a typewritten communication the address on the envelope is typewritten the letter itself is typewritten i will now read the letter to you it is as follows mr mayor you are a young man in an old town but you are old enough and sharp enough to take a hint take one now and mind your own business what business is it of yours to interfere with good old customs in a place which you don't belong and where you're still a comparative stranger you only got elected to the mayoral chair by one vote and if you are fool enough to think that you and those behind you are strong enough to upset things you'll find yourself wrong for you won't be allowed there's something a good deal stronger in this town than what you and them are and that you'll see proved or happen you won't see it for if you go on as you are doing putting your nose in where you've no right you'll be made so that you'll never see nor hear again things is not going to be upset here for want of putting upsetters out of the way there's been better men than you quietly sided for less so take a quiet warning leave things alone it would become you a deal better if you'd be a bit more hospitable to the council and give them a glass of decent wine instead of the teetotal stuff you disgraced the table with when you gave your mayoral banquet first time any mayor of this good old borough ever did such a thing there's them that's had quite enough of such goings on and doesn't mind how soon you're shifted so mend your ways before somebody makes them as they'll never need mending any more now gentlemen continued the coroner as he laid down the letter there are one or two things about that communication to which i wish to draw your attention first of all it is the composition of a vulgar and illiterate or at any rate semi-illiterate person i don't think its phrasing and illiteracy are affected i think it has been written in its present colloquial form without art or design by whoever wrote it it is written phrased expressed precisely as a vulgar coarse sort of person would speak that is the first point the second is it is typewritten now in these days there are a great many typewriting machines in use in the town small as the town is we know there are a great many in offices shops institutions banks even private houses it is not at all likely that the sender of this letter would employ a professional typist to write it not even a clerk nor any employee therefore he typed it himself i will invite your attention to the letter which i now hand to you and then i will place it in the custody of the police who will of course use their best endeavours to trace it he passed the letter over to the foreman of the jury and turned to the witness box i conclude mr epplewhite that the late mayor left that letter in your possession he asked he did sir replied epplewhite he said half jokingly you can keep that epplewhite if they sacrifice me on the altar of vested interests it'll be a bit of evidence so i locked up the letter in my safe there and then and it has remained there until this morning you of course have no idea as to the identity of the sender none sir had mr wallingford neither of us sir formed any conclusion but we both thought that the letter emanated from some member of the opposition did mr wallingford take it as a serious threat epplewhite looked doubtful i scarcely know he said he seemed half-minded about it to regard it you know as half a joke and half serious but i feel certain that he knew he had enemies who might become well deadly that's my distinct impression mr coroner the typewritten letter went its round of the jury and presently came back to the coroner he replaced it in its envelope and handed the envelope to hawthwaite you must leave no stone unturned in your effort to trace that letter to its source he said 
That's of the highest importance. And now I think we had better adjourn for— But Tansley rose from his seat at Brent's elbow. I should like to draw attention to a somewhat pertinent fact, Mr. Coroner, he said. It seems to have a distinct bearing on what has just transpired. During a search of the deceased's private papers, made by Mr. Brent and myself yesterday afternoon, we found Mr. Wallingford's will. It was drawn up by himself in very concise terms, and duly executed only a few days before his death. It suggests itself to me that he was impelled to this by the threat which is distinctly made in the letter you have just read. I think we may take it that the late mayor felt that he was in some personal danger, answered the coroner. What you say, Mr. Tansley, appears to corroborate that. Then, with a few words of counsel to the jury, he adjourned the inquest for ten days, and presently the folk who had listened to the proceedings streamed out into the marketplace, excited and voluble. Instead of going away, the greater number of those who had been present lingered around the entrance, and Brent, leaving in Tansley's company a few minutes later, found high words being spoken between Alderman Crood and Epplewhite, who, prominent on the pavement, were haranguing each other amidst a ring of open-mouthed bystanders. "'You were at that game all through what you called your evidence,' vociferated Alderman Crood, who was obviously excited and angry far beyond his wont. "'Nice evidence, indeed. Nor is it but trying to fasten blame on to innocent folk.' "'Suggesting,' sneered Mallet, close on his leader's right elbow, "'insinuating.' "'Hinting at things,' said Coppinger, close on the left, "'implying.' "'Dirty work,' shouted Alderman Crood, "'such as nobody but the likes of you, "'radicals and teetotalers and chapel folk, "'would ever think of doing. "'You say straight out before the town "'what's in your mind, Sam Epplewhite, "'and I'll see what the law has to say to you. "'I'm none going to have my character "'taken away by a fellow of your sort. "'Say your say here in public?' "'I'll say my say at the right time and place,' Alderman Crood retorted Epplewhite. "'This thing's going through. We'll find out who murdered John Wallingford yet. There's no need to go far away to find the murderer.' Crood's big face grew livid with anger, and his long upper lip began to quiver. He raised his hand as if to command the attention of the crowd, but just then Hawthwaite and a couple of policemen appeared at the open doorway behind, and Mallet and Coppinger, nudging the big man from either side, led him away along the market-place. And suddenly, from amongst the dispersing crowd, distinct murmurs of disapproval and dislike arose, crystallized in a sharp cry from some man on its outer edge. "'Down with the town trustees! They're at the bottom of this! Down with them!' The town trustees retreated before a suddenly awakened chorus of hooting. They disappeared into Mallet's private door at the bank. Brent, watching and listening with speculative curiosity, felt Tansley touch his arm. He turned to find the solicitor shaking his head, and with a grave countenance. "'Bad, bad,' muttered Tansley. "'Very bad. Once get public opinion set on like that, and—' "'And what?' demanded Brent. He was already so convinced that his cousin had fallen a victim to political hatred that he was rather welcoming the revengeful outburst of feeling. What now? There'll be an end of all sensible and practical proceedings in connection with the affair, answered Tansley. There's a big following of the Reform Party in the town amongst the working folk, and if they once get it into their heads that the Conservative lot put your cousin away, well, there'll be hell to pay. Personally, said Brent, with a hardening of his square jaw, I don't care if there is. If we can only put our hands on the murderers, I don't care if the people hang them to those lamp-posts. I shouldn't be sorry to see a little lynch law. Then we shall never get at the truth, retorted Dansley. We may, only may, mind you, have got a bit towards it this morning, but not far, if at all, perhaps. That threatening letter, suggested Brent, "'I attach very little importance to it,' said Tansley, "'though I wasn't going to say so much in court. "'In my experience in this town, "'if I've seen one anonymous letter, I've seen a hundred. "'Hathelsborough folk are given to that sort of thing. 
no sir there's a tremendous lot to come out yet don't you be surprised if all sorts of extraordinary developments materialize perhaps when you're least expecting em brent made no answer he was not easily surprised and from the moment of his discovery of the crime he had realized that this was a mystery in the unravelling of which time and trouble would have to be expended freely but he had a moment of genuine surprise that evening when as he sat in his private sitting-room at the chancellor he received a note written in a delicate feminine hand on crested and scented paper wherein he was requested in somewhat guarded and mysterious fashion to step round to the private residence of mrs somarez end of chapter seven chapter eight of in the mayor's parlour by j s fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain mrs somarez brent at that moment was in a state of mind which made every fibre of his being particularly sensitive to suspicions and speculative ideas he had no sooner slipped mrs somarez's note into his pocket than he began to wonder why she had sent for him of course it had something to do with wallingford's murder but what if mrs somarez knew anything why did she not speak at the inquest she had been present all through the proceedings brent had frequently turned his eyes on her always he had seen her in the same watchful keen-eyed attitude apparently deeply absorbed in the evidence and it seemed to him showing signs of a certain amount of anxiety anxiety yes that was it anxiety the other spectators were curious morbidly curious most of them but mrs somarez he felt sure was anxious and about what he wondered but wondering was no good he must go and see her of course and presently he made himself ready and set out but as he crossed the hall of the hotel he encountered tansley who was just emerging from the smoking-room a thought occurred to him and he motioned tansley back into the room he had just quitted and led him to a quiet corner i say said brent between ourselves i've just had a note from that mrs sauber as we saw this morning in the coroner's court she wants me to go round to her house at once tansley showed his interest ah he exclaimed then she's something to tell why to me demanded brent you're wallingford's next of kin said the solicitor laconically that's why wonder what it is muttered brent some feminine fancy maybe go and find out man laughed tansley just so replied brent i'm going now but look here who and what is this mrs somarez post me up tansley waved his cigar in the air as if implying that you could draw a circle around his field of knowledge oh well he said you saw her to-day so you're already aware that she's young and pretty and charming and all that as for the rest she's a widow and a wealthy one relict as we say in the law of a naval officer of high rank who i fancy was some years older than herself she came here about two years ago and rents a picturesque old place that was built long since out of the ruins of the old benedictine abbey that used to stand at the rear of what's now called abbey gate some of the ruins as you know are still there clever woman reads a lot and all that sort of thing not at all a society woman in spite of her prettiness bit of a blue stocking i fancy scarcely know her myself i think you said my cousin knew her suggested brent your cousin and she latterly were very thick asserted tansley he spent a lot of time at her house during nearly all last summer and winter though she was away in the south of france oh yes wallingford often went to dine with her she has a companion who lives with her that elderly woman we saw this morning yes i suppose wallingford went there oh two or three evenings a week in fact there were people gossipers who firmly believed that he and mrs somarez were going to make a match of it might be so but up to about the end of last summer the same people used to say that she was going to marry the doctor wellesley brent pricked his ears he scarcely knew why wellesley he said what was he a uh, a suitor 
oh well answered tansley i think the lady's one of the sort that's much fonder of men's society than of women's you know anyway after she came here she and wellesley seemed to take to each other and she used to be in his company a good deal used to go out driving with him a lot and so on and he used to go to the abbey house at that time just as much as your cousin did of late but about the end of last summer mrs saumarez seemed to cool off with wellesley and take on with wallingford fact the doctor got his nose put out by the lawyer there's no doubt about it and there's no doubt either that the result was the distinct coolness not to say dislike between wellesley and wallingford for up to then those two had been rather close friends but they certainly weren't after mrs saumarez plainly showed a preference for wallingford and in spite of that continued tansley as if some afterthought struck him i'll say this for wellesley he's never allowed his undoubted jealousy of wallingford to prevent him from supporting wallingford on the town council wellesley indeed has always been one of his staunchest and most consistent supporters oh dr wellesley's on the town council is he asked brent and a reform man he's councillor for the riverside ward answered tansley and a regular radical in fact he wallingford and that chap epplewhite were the three recognised leaders of the reform party yes wellesley stuck to wallingford as leader even when it became pretty evident that wallingford had ousted him in mrs saumarez's affections fact affections eh surmised brent you think it had come to as much as that i do affirmed tansley lord bless you she and wallingford were as thick as thieves as our local saying goes oh yes i'm sure she threw wellesley over for wallingford brent heard all this in silence and remained for a time in further silence hm he remarked at last odd mrs saumarez is an unusually pretty woman dr wellesley is a very handsome man now my cousin was about as plain and insignificant a chap to look at as ever i came across poor fellow your cousin was a damn clever chap said tansley incisively he got brains my dear sir and where women cleverish women anyhow are concerned brains are going to win all the way and come in winners by as many lengths as you please mrs saumarez i understand is a woman who dabbles in politics and your cousin interested her and when a woman gets deeply interested in a man i guess you're right assented brent well i'll step along and see her he left tansley in the hotel and went away along the market-place wondering a good deal about the information just given to him so there was a coolness between his cousin and wellesley was there a coolness that amounted said tansley to something stronger did it amount to jealousy did the jealousy lead to but at that point brent gave up speculating if there was anything in this new suggestion mrs saumarez would hold the key once more he was face to face with the fact that had steadily obtruded itself upon him during the last two days that here in this time-worn old place there were folks who had secrets and did things in a curiously secret fashion mrs saumarez's house stood a little way back from the street called abbey gate an old apparently early jacobean mansion set amidst the elms for which hathelsborough was famous so profusely and to such a height did they grow all over the town a smart parlour-maid who looked inquisitively at him and was evidently expecting his arrival admitted brent and led him at once along a half-lighted hall into a little room where the light of a shaded lamp shone on a snug and comfortable interior and on rows of more books than any young and pretty women generally possess left alone for a few minutes brent glanced around the well-filled shelves and formed the opinion that mrs saumarez went in for very solid reading chiefly in the way of social and political economy he began to see now why she and the murdered mayor had been such close friends the subjects that apparently interested her had been those in which wallingford had always been deeply absorbed maybe then mrs saumarez had been behind the reform party in hathelsborough there was a woman wire-puller at the back of these matters as a rule he believed that sort of thing perhaps was mrs saumarez's little hobby he turned from these speculations to find her at his elbow 
"'Thank you for coming, Mr. Brent,' she said softly. Brent looked attentively at her as he took the hand which she held out to him. Seen at closer quarters, he saw that she was a much prettier woman than he had fancied. He saw, too, that whatever her tastes might be in the way of politics and sociology, she was wholly feminine, and not above enhancing her charms by punctilious attention to her general appearance and setting. She had been very quietly and even somberly dressed at the inquest that morning, but she was now in evening dress, and her smart gown, her wealth of fair hair, her violet eyes, and the rose tint of her little cheek somewhat dazzled Brent, who was not greatly used to women's society. He felt a little shy and a little awkward. "'Yes, yes, I came at once,' he said. "'I, of course, I gathered that you wanted me.' Mrs. Saumarez smiled, and pointing to an easy chair in front of the bright fire, dropped into another close by it. "'Sit down, Mr. Brent,' she said. "'Yes, I wanted you, and I couldn't very well go to the Chancellor, could I? So thank you again for coming so promptly. Perhaps,' she turned and looked at him steadily, "'you're already aware that your cousin and I were great friends?' "'I've heard it,' answered Brent. He nodded at one of the bookcases at which she had found him looking. Similar taste, I suppose. He was a great hand at that sort of thing. Yes, she said. We had a good deal in common. I was much interested in all his plans, and so on. He was a very clever man, a deeply interesting man, and I have felt this more than I'm going to say. And, but I think I'd better tell you why I sent for you. Yes, assented Brent. I gathered from what was said at the inquest this morning that you are your cousin's sole executor, she asked. I am, replied Brent, sole everything. Then, of course, you have entire charge and custody of his papers, she suggested. That's so, answered Brent. Everything's in my possession. Mrs. Saumarez sighed gently. It seemed to Brent that there was something of relief in the sigh. Last autumn and winter, she continued presently, I was away from home a long time. I was in the south of France. Mr. Wallingford and I kept up a regular and frequent correspondence. It was just then, you know, that he became mayor, and began to formulate his schemes for the regeneration of this rotten little town. "'You think it's that, eh?' interrupted Brent, emphasizing the personal pronoun. "'That's your conviction?' Mrs. Somarez's violet eyes flashed and a queer little smile played for a second time round the corner of her pretty lips. "'Rotten to the core,' she said quietly. "'Ripe rotten. He knew it. Knew more than he ever let anyone know.' "'More than he ever let you know?' asked Brent. "'I knew a good deal,' she replied evasively. "'But this correspondence. We wrote to each other twice a week all the time I was away. I have all his letters, there, in that safe.' "'Yes?' said Brent. Mrs. Somarez looked down at the slim fingers which lay in her lap. "'He kept all mine,' she continued. "'Yes?' repeated Brent. "'I want them,' she murmured, with a sudden lifting of her eyelids in her visitor's direction. "'I, naturally, I don't want them to—to to fall into anybody else's hands. You understand, Mr. Brent?' "'You want me to find them?' suggested Brent. Not to find them, that is, not to search for them, she replied quickly. I know where they are. I want you, if you please, to give them back to me. Where are they? asked Brent. He told me where he kept them, answered Mrs. Somarez. They are in a cedar wood cabinet, in a drawer in his bedroom. All right, said Brent, I'll get them. Was he mistaken in thinking that it was an unmistakable sigh of relief that left Mrs. Somarez's delicate red lips? and that an additional little flush of colour came into her cheeks. But her voice was calm and even enough. "'Thank you,' she said. "'So good of you. Of course they aren't of the faintest interest to anybody. I can have them, then. When?' Brent rose to his feet. "'When I was taught my business,' he said with a dry smile, "'I'd a motto drummed into my head, day in and day out. Do it now.' So I guess I'll just go round to my cousin's old rooms and get you that cabinet at once. Mrs. Somarez smiled. It was a smile that would have thrilled most men. 
but Brent merely got a deepened impression of her prettiness. "'I like your way of doing things,' she said. "'That's business. You ought to stop here, Mr. Brent, and take up your cousin's work.' "'It would be a fitting tribute to his memory, wouldn't it?' answered Brent. "'Well, I don't know. But this letter business is a thing to do now. I'll be back in ten minutes, Mrs. Omarez. "'Let yourself in, and come straight here,' she said. "'I'll wait for you.' Wallingford's old rooms were close at hand, only round the corner, in fact, and Brent went straight to them and into the bedroom. He found the cedar cabinet at once. He had, in fact, seen it the day before, but finding it locked had made no attempt to open it. He carried it back to Mrs. Somarez, set it on her desk, and laid beside it a bunch of keys. "'I suppose you'll find this key amongst those,' he said. "'They're all the private keys of his that I have, anyway.' "'Perhaps you will find it,' she suggested. "'I'm a bad hand at that sort of thing.' Brent had little difficulty in finding the right key. Unthinkingly he raised the lid of the cabinet, and quickly closed it again. In that momentary glimpse of the contents it seemed to him that he had unearthed a dead man's secret, for in addition to a pile of letters he had seen a woman's glove, a knot of ribbon, some faded flowers. "'That's it,' he said hurriedly, shutting down the lid and affecting to have seen nothing. "'I'll take the key off the bunch.' Mrs. Somarez took the key from him in silence, relocked the cabinet and carried it over to a safe let into the wall of the room. "'Thank you, Mr. Brent,' she said. "'I'm glad to have those letters.' Brent made as if to leave, but he suddenly turned on her. "'You know a lot,' he remarked brusquely. "'What's your opinion about my cousin's murder?' Mrs. Somarez remained silent so long that he spoke again. Uh, "'Do you think, from what you've seen of things in this town, that it was what we may call political, he asked, a, a removal? He was watching her closely, and he saw the violet eyes grow sombre and a certain hardness settle about the lines of the well-shaped mouth and chin. It's this, she said suddenly. I told you just now that this town is rotten, rotten and corrupt as so many of these little old-world English boroughs are. He knew it, poor fellow. He's steadily been finding it out ever since he came here. I dare say you, coming from London, a great city, wouldn't understand. But it's this way. This town is run by a gang, the members of which manoeuvre everything for their own and their friends' benefit, their friends and their hangers-on, their associates, their toadies. They... Do you mean the town trustees? asked Brent. Not wholly, replied Mrs. Somarez. But all that Epplewhite said today about the town trustees is true. The three men control the financial affairs of the borough. Wallingford, by long and patient investigation, had come to know how they controlled them, and how utterly corrupt and rotten the whole financial administration is. If you could see some of the letters of his which I have in that safe. Wouldn't it be well to produce them? suggested Brent. Not yet, anyway, she said. I'll consider that. Much of it's general statement, not particular accusation. But the town trustees' question is not all. Until very recently, when a reform party gradually got into being, and increased steadily, though it's still in a minority, the whole representation and administration of the borough was hopelessly bad and unprincipled. For what do you suppose men went into the town council? To represent the ratepayer, the townspeople? No, but to look after their own interests, to safeguard themselves, to get what they could out of it. The whole policy of the old councils was one of, there's only one word for it, Mr. Brent, and that's only just becoming anglicized, graft. Now, the corporation of a town is supposed to exist for the good, the welfare, the protection of a town, but the whole idea of these Hathelsborough men in the past has been to use their power and privileges as administrators for their own ends. So here you've had, on the one hand, the unfortunate ratepayer, and on the other, a close corporation, a privileged band of pirates, battening on them. In plain words, there are about a hundred men in Hathelsborough 
who have used the seven or eight thousand other folk as a means to their own ends. The town has been a helpless, defenceless thing, from which these harpies have picked whatever they could lay their talons on. "'That's the conclusion he'd come to?' asked Brent. "'He couldn't have come to any other after many years of patient investigation,' declared Mrs. Saumarez. "'And he was the sort of man who had an inborn hatred of abuses and shams and hypocrisy. "'And now, put it to yourself, when a man stands up against vested interests, such as exist here, and says plainly that he's never going to rest nor leave a stone unturned until he's made a radical and thorough reformation, do you think he's going to have a primrose path of it? Bah! But he knew. He knew his danger. But murder, said Brent, murder. Mrs. Somerez shook her head. Yes, she answered, but there are men in this place who wouldn't stick at even that. You don't know. If Wallingford had done all the things he'd vowed to do, there would have been such an exposure of affairs here as would have made the whole country agape, and some men would have been ruined, literally, I know, and things will come out and be tracked down if no red herrings are drawn across the trail. You're going to get at the truth? By God, yes, exclaimed Brent with sudden fervour. I am so. "'Look for his murderers amongst the men he intended to show up then,' she said, with a certain fierce intensity. "'And look closely, and secretly. There's no other way.' Brent presently left her, and went off wondering about the contents of the little cabinet. He would have wondered still more if he had been able to look back into the cosy room which he had just left. For when he had gone, Mrs. Somerez took the cabinet from the safe, and carefully emptied the whole of its contents into the glowing heart of the fire. She stood watching as the flames flicked round them, and until there was nothing left but black ash. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of In the Mayor's Parlour by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Right to Intervene Brent went back to his hotel to find the town clerk of Hathelsborough waiting for him in his private sitting-room. His visitor, a sharp-eyed man whose profession was suggested in every look and movement, greeted him with a suavity of manner which set Brent on his guard. "'I am here, Mr. Brent,' he said, with an almost deprecating smile, "'as, well, as a sort of informal deputation. Informal!' "'Deputations represent somebody or something,' retorted Brent, in his brusquest fashion. "'Whom do you represent?' "'The borough authorities,' replied the town clerk, with another smile. "'That is to say—you'll excuse me for interrupting,' said Brent. "'I'm a man of plain speech. I take it that by borough authorities you mean, say, Mr. Simon Crood and his fellow town trustees. That so?' "'Well, perhaps so,' admitted the town clerk. Mr. Alderman Crood, to be sure, is deputy mayor, and he and his brother town trustees are certainly men of authority. "'What do you want?' demanded Brent. The town clerk lowered his voice, quite unnecessarily in Brent's opinion. His suave tones became dulcet and mollifying. "'My dear sir,' he said, leaning forward, "'tomorrow you, you have the sad task of interring your cousin, our late greatly respected mayor.' "'Going to bury him tomorrow,' responded Brent. "'Just so. Well?' "'There is a rumour in the town that you intend the, uh, ceremony to be absolutely private,' continued the town clerk. "'I do,' assented Brent, "'and it will be.' The town clerk made a little expostulatory sound. "'My dear sir,' he said soothingly, "'the late Mr. Wallingford was mayor of Hathelsborough the 481st mayor of Hathelsborough, Mr. Brent. Brent, who was leaning against the mantelpiece, looked fixedly at his visitor. Supposing he was the 999th mayor of Hathelsborough, he asked quietly, what then? He should have a public funeral, declared the town clerk promptly. My dear sir, to inter a mayor of Hathelsborough, and the 481st holder of the ancient and most dignified office, 
privately as if he were um, a mere nobody a common townsman is oh really it's unheard of that the notion of the men who sent you here asked brent grimly the notion as you call it of the gentleman who sent me here mr brent is that your cousin's funeral obsequies should be of a public nature answered the town clerk according to precedent of course during my term of office as town clerk two mayors have died during their year of mayoralty on such occasions the corporation has been present in state in state said brent what does that amount to sort of procession a duly marshalled one answered the town clerk the beadle with his mace the deputy mayor the recorder the recorder and town clerk of course in wigs and gowns the aldermen in their furred robes the councillors in their violet gowns a very stately procession mr brent preceding the funeral cortege to st hathelwood's church where the vicar as mayor's chaplain would deliver a funeral oration the procession would return subsequently to the moot hall for wine and cake brent rubbed his square chin staring hard at his visitor hm he said at last well there isn't going to be anything of that sort to-morrow i'm just going to bury my cousin quietly and privately without maces and furred robes and violet gowns so you can just tell him politely nothing doing but my dear sir my good mr brent expostulated the visitor the mayor of hathelsborough the oldest borough in the country why our charter of incorporation dates from i'm not particularly interested in archaeology just now anyway interrupted brent and it's nothing to me in connection with this matter if your old charter was signed by william the conqueror or edward the confessor i say nothing doing but your reasons my dear sir your reasons exclaimed the town clerk such a breaking with established custom and precedent i really don't know what the neighbouring boroughs will say of us let him say retorted brent he laughed contemptuously but suddenly his mood changed and he turned on his visitor with what the town clerk afterwards described as a very ugly look but if you want to know he added i'll tell you why i won't have any corporation processing after my cousin's dead body it's because i believe that his murderer is one of em see the town clerk a rosy-cheeked man turned pale his gloves lay on the table at his elbow and his fingers trembled a little as he picked them up and began fitting them on with meticulous precision my dear sir he said in a tone that suggested his profession more strongly than ever that's very grave language as a solicitor i should advise you when i say murderer continued brent i'm perhaps wrong i might and no doubt ought to use the plural murderers i believe that more than one of your rascally corporation conspired to murder my cousin and i'm going to have no blood-stained hypocrites processing after his coffin you tell him to keep away i had better withdraw said the town clerk no hurry observed brent changing to geniality he laid his hand on the bell have a whisky and soda and a cigar we've finished our business and i guess you're a man as well as a lawyer but the visitor was unable to disassociate his personal identity from his office and he bowed himself out brent laughed when he had gone got the weight of four hundred and eighty-one years of incorporation on him he said lord it's like living with generation after generation of your grandfather's slung round you four hundred and eighty-one years must have been in the bad old days when this mouldy town got its charter next morning brent buried the dead mare in st hathelwood's churchyard privately and quietly he stayed by the grave until the sexton and his assistants had laid the green turf over it that done he went round to the abbey house and sought out mrs saumarez after his characteristic fashion he spoke out what was in his mind i've pretty well fixed up in myself to do what you suggested last night he said giving her one of his direct glances you know what i mean to go on with his work mrs saumarez's eyes sparkled that would be splendid she exclaimed but if he had opposition you'll have it a hundredfold you're not afraid 
afraid of nothing said brent carelessly but i just don't know how i'd get any right to do it i'm not a townsman i've no locus standi but then he wasn't to begin with i'd forgotten that said mrs saumarez and you'd have to give up your work in london journalism isn't it i've thought of that said brent well i've had a pretty good spell at it and i'm not so keen about keeping on it any longer there's other work literary work i'd prefer and i'm not dependent on it anyway i've got means of my own and now wallingford's left me a good lot of money no i guess i wouldn't mind coming here and going on with a job he'd set himself to i'd like to do it but then how to get a footing in the place mrs saumarez considered for a while suddenly her face lighted up you've got money she said why don't you buy a bit of property in the town a piece of real estate then brent picked up his hat that's a good notion he said i'll step round and see tansley about it tansley had been one of the very few men whom brent had invited to be present at his cousin's internment he had just changed his mourning garments for those of everyday life and was settling down to his professional business when brent was shown into his private office busy demanded brent in his usual laconic fashion give you whatever time you want answered the solicitor who knew his man by that time what is it now i've concluded to take up my abode in this old town said brent with something of a sheepish smile seems queer no doubt but my mind's fixed and so look here you don't know anybody that's got a bit of real estate to sell nice little house or something of that sort if so tansley thrust his letters and papers aside pushed an open box of cigars in his visitor's direction and lighting one himself became inquisitively attentive what's the game he asked brent lighted a cigar and took two or three meditative puffs at it before answering this direct question well he said at last i don't think that i'm a particularly sentimental sort of person but all the same i'm not storm-proof against sentiment and i've just got the conviction that it's up to me to go on with my cousin's job in this place tansley took his cigar from his lips and whistled tall order brent he remarked so i reckon assented brent but i've served an apprenticeship to that sort of thing and i've always gone through with whatever came my way let's be plain said tansley you mean that you want to settle here in the town and go on with wallingford's reform policy that's just it replied brent you've got it all i can say is then that you're rendering yourself up to well not envy but certainly to hatred malice and all uncharitableness as it's phrased in the prayer book declared tansley you'll have a hot old time used to him retorted brent you forget i've been a pressman for some years but you didn't get that sort of thing suggested tansley half incredulous brent flicked the ash from his cigar and smiled don't go in for tall talk he said lazily but it was i who tracked down the defaulting directors of the great combined amalgamation affair and ran to earth that chap who murdered his ward away up in northumberland and found the pembury absconding bank manager who'd scooted off so cleverly that the detectives couldn't trace even a smile of him pretty stiff propositions all those and i reckon i can do my bit here in this place on wallingford's lines if i can get the right to intervene as a townsman that's just what i want locus standi and when you've got it asked tansley brent worked his cigar into the corner of his firm lips and folding his arms stared straight in front of him well he said slowly i think i've fixed that in my own mind fixed it all out while the parson was putting him away in that old churchyard this morning i was thinking hard while he was reading his book i understand that by my cousin's death there's a vacancy in the town council he sat for some ward or other he sat for the castle ward as town councillor assented tansley so of course there's a vacancy well continued brent i reckon i'll put up for that vacancy i'll be mr councillor richard brent you're a stranger man laughed tansley i'll not be in a week's time retorted brent i'll be known to every householder in that ward but this locus standi 
if i bought real estate in the town i'd be a townsman wouldn't i a burgess i reckon and then why legally i'd be as much a hassles for a man as say simon crood tansley took his hands out of his pockets and began to search amongst his papers well you're a go-ahead chap brent he said evidently not the sort to let grass grow under your feet and if you want to buy a bit of nice property i've the very goods for you there's a client of mine john chillingham a retired tradesman who wants to sell his house he's desirous of quitting this part of the country and going to live on the south coast it's a delightful bit of property just at the back of the castle and it's therefore in the castle ward acacia lodge it's called nice roomy old-fashioned house in splendid condition modernized set in a beautiful old garden with a magnificent cedar tree on the lawn and a fine view from its front windows and for a quick sale cheap what's the figure asked brent two thousand guineas answered tansley brent reached for his hat let's go and look at it he said within a few hours brent had settled his purchase of acacia lodge from the retired tradesman and tansley was busy with the legal necessities of the conveyance that done and in his new character of townsman and property owner brent sought out peppermore and into that worthy's itching and astonished ears poured out a confession which the editor of the monitor was to keep secret until the next day after which retiring to his sitting-room at the chancellor he took up pen and paper and proceeded to write a document which occasioned him more thought than he usually gave to his literary productions it was not a lengthy document but it had been rewritten and interlineated and corrected several times before brent carried it to the monitor office and the printing press peppermore reading it over grinned with malicious satisfaction that'll make em open their mouths and their eyes to-morrow morning mr brent he exclaimed we'll have it posted all over the town by ten o'clock sir powerful organ mr brent very powerful organ can do on your behalf and in your interest shall be done sir it shall be done con amore as i believe they say in italy thank ye said brent you're the right stuff don't mention it sir replied peppermore only too pleased egad i wish i could see mr alderman crood's face when he reads this poster at five minutes past ten next morning as he mallet and coppinger came together out of the side door of the bank where they had been in close conference since half-past nine on affairs of their own mr alderman crood saw the poster on which was set out brent's election address to the voters of the castle ward the bill-posting people had pasted a copy of it on a blank wall opposite the three men open-mouthed and wide-eyed gathered round and read crude grew purple with anger impudence he exclaimed at last sheer brazen impudence him a stranger take up his cousin's work will he and what's he mean by saying that he's now a hathelsborough man i heard about that last night answered coppinger tansley told two or three of us at the club this fellow brent has brought that property of old chillingham's acacia lodge freehold you know bought it right out he's a hathelsborough man now right enough then they both turned and glanced at mallet who was re-reading brent's election address with brooding eyes and lowering brow well demanded coppinger what do you make out of it mallet mallet removed his glasses and sniffed don't let's deceive ourselves he said with a hasty glance round this chap's out to make trouble he's no fool either if he gets into the council we shall have an implacable enemy and he's every chance so it's all the more necessary than ever that we should bring off to-morrow what we've been talking about this morning we ought to do that said coppinger we can count on fourteen sure votes ay said mallet but so can they the thing is the three votes neither party can count on we must get at those three men to-day if we don't carry our point to-morrow we shall have sam epplewhite or dr wellesley as mayor and things shall be as bad as they were under wallingford 
This conversation referred to an extraordinary meeting of the town council, which had been convened for the next day in order to elect a new mayor of Hathelsborough in succession to John Wallingford, deceased. Brent heard of it that afternoon from Queenie Crude in the castle grounds. He had met Queenie there more than once since their first encountering in those sheltered nooks. Already he was not quite sure that he was not looking forward with increasing pleasure to these meetings. For with each, Queenie came further out of her shell. The more they met, the more she let him see of herself, and he found her interesting. And they had given up talking of Queenie's stage ambitions, not that she had thrown them over, but that she and Brent had begun to find the discussion of their own personalities more to the immediate point than the canvassing of remote possibilities. Each, in fact, was in the stage of finding each other a mine worth exploring. Brent began to see a lot in Queenie and her dark eyes. Queenie was beginning to consider Brent, with his grim jaw, his brusque off-hand speech and masterful manner, a curiously fascinating person. Besides, he was beginning to do things that only strong men do. "'You're in high disgrace at the tannery house,' she remarked archly, when they met that afternoon. "'I should think your ears must have burned this dinner-time.' "'Why now?' inquired Brent. "'Uncle Simon brought Mallet and Coppinger home to dinner,' continued Queenie. "'It was lucky there was a big hot joint. They're all great eaters and drinkers.' and they abused you to their heart's content. This town council business, they say it's infernal impudence for you to put up for election. However, Coppinger says you'll not get in. Coppinger is a bad prophet, said Brent. I'll be town councillor in a fortnight. Lay anybody ten to one. Well, they'll do everything they can to keep you out, declared Queenie. You've got to fight an awful lot of opposition. Let them all come, retorted Brent. I'll represent the castle ward, and now that I'm a burgess of Hathelsborough, I'll be mayor some old time. Not yet, though, said Queenie. They're going to elect a new mayor tomorrow, in place of your cousin, of course. Brent started. Nobody had mentioned that to him. Yet he might have thought of it himself. Of course there must be a new mayor of Hathelsborough. Gad, I hope it'll not be one of the old gang, he muttered. If it is but by noon next day he heard that the old gang had triumphed. Mr. Alderman Crude was elected mayor of Hathelsborough by a majority of two votes. A couple of the wobblers on the council had given way at the last moment and thrown in their lot with the reactionary Let Things Alone party. "'Never mind. I'll win my election,' said Brent. "'The future is with me.' He set to work in strenuous fashion to enlist the favours of the castle ward electorate. All day, from early morning until late at night, he was cultivating the acquaintance of the Burgesses. He had little time for any other business than this. There were but ten days before the election. But now and then he visited the police station and interviewed Hawthwaite, and at each visit he found the superintendent becoming increasingly reserved and mysterious in manner. Hawthwaite would say nothing definite, but he dropped queer hints about certain things that he had up his sleeve to be duly produced at the adjourned inquest. As to what they were, he remained resolutely silent, even to Brent. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of In the Mayor's Parlor by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat in the Bag. But as the day of the adjourned inquest drew near, Brent became aware that there were rumors in the air, rumors of some sensational development, the particulars of which were either non obtainable or utterly vague. He heard of them from Peppermore, whose journalistic itching for news had so far gone unrelieved. Peppermore himself knew no more than that rumour was busy and secret. "'Can't make out for the life of me what it is, Mr. Brent,' said Peppermore, calling upon Brent at the Chancellor on the eve of the inquiry. "'But there's something, sir, something. You know that boy of mine, young Prider?' "'Smart youth,' replied Brent. 
"'As they make em, sir,' agreed Peppermore. "'That boy, Mr. Brent, will go far in the profession of which you're a shining and I'm a dim light. He's got what the French, I believe, sir, call a flair for news. Took to our line like a duck to water, Mr. Brent. Well, now, young Pryder's father is a policeman, sergeant in the borough constabulary, and naturally he's opportunities of knowing. And when he knows, he talks, in the home circle, Mr. Brent.' "'Been talking?' asked Brent. "'Guardedly, sir, guardedly,' replied Peppermore. "'Young Pryder, he told me this afternoon that his father, when he came home to dinner today, said to him and his mother that when the inquests reopen tomorrow, there's be something to talk about. Somebody,' said Sergeant Pryder, "'would have something to talk of before the day was over. So there you are.' "'I suppose old Pryder didn't tell young Pryder any more than that,' suggested brent he did not sir said peppermore had he done so jimmy prider would have made half a column big type let it out of it no nothing more there are men in this world mr brent as you have doubtless observed who are given to throwing out mere hints sort of men who always look at you as much as to say ah i could tell you a lot if i would i guess sergeant prider's one of em "'Whatever Sergeant Pryder knows, he's got from Hawthwaite, of course,' remarked Brent. "'To be sure, sir,' agreed Peppermore. "'Hawthwaite's been up to something. i felt that for some days. I imagine there'll be new witnesses tomorrow, but who they'll be I can't think.' Brent could not think either, nor did he understand Hawthwaite's reserve. But he wasted no time in speculation. He had already made up his mind that unless something definite arose at the resumed inquiry, he would employ professional detective assistance and get to work on lines of his own. He had already seen enough of Hathelsborough ways and Hathelsborough folk to feel convinced that if this affair of his cousin's murder could be hushed up, it would be hushed up. The Simon Crood gang, he was persuaded, would move heaven and earth to smooth things over and consign the entire episode to oblivion. Against that process he meant to labour. In his opinion, the stirring up of strong public interest was the line to take, and he was fully determined that if the coroner and his twelve good men and true could not sift the problem of this inquiry to the bottom, he would. That public feeling and curiosity, mainly curiosity, were still strong enough, and were lasting well over the proverbial nine days, Brent saw as soon as he quitted the hall door of the Chancellor next morning. The open space between High Cross and the Boot Hall was packed with people, eager to enter the big courtroom as soon as the doors were thrown open. Conscious that he himself would get a seat whoever else did not, Brent remained standing on the steps of the hotel, lazily watching the gossiping crowd. And suddenly Mrs. Saumarez, once more attired in the semi-mourning which she had affected at the earlier proceedings, and attended by the same companion, came along the market-place in his direction. Brent went down and joined her. "'Pretty stiff crowd,' he remarked laconically. "'I'm afraid you'll find it a bit of a crush this time. I suppose you'll not let that stop you, though.' He noticed then that Mrs. Saumarez was looking anxious, perhaps a little distressed, and certainly not too well pleased. She gave him a glance which began at himself, and ended at a folded paper which she carried in her well-gloved hand. "'I've got to go,' she murmured. "'Got to, whether I like it or not. They've served me with a summons as a witness. Ridiculous! What do I know about it? All that I do know is private.' Brent stared at the bit of paper. He, too, was wondering what the coroner wanted with Mrs. Saumarez. "'I'm afraid they haven't much respect for privacy in these affairs,' he remarked. Odd, though, that if they want you now, they didn't want you at the first sitting. "'Do you think they'll ask questions that are private?' she suggested half-timidly. "'Can't say,' replied Brent. "'You'd better be prepared for anything. You know best, after all, what they can ask you. I reckon the best thing in these affairs is just to answer plainly and be done with it.' "'There are certain things one doesn't want raking up,' she murmured. "'For instance, do you think you'll have to give evidence again?' maybe said brent she gave him a meaning look and lowered her voice well she whispered if you have to don't let anything come out about 
uh, about those letters. You know what I mean, the letters you got for me from his rooms. I, I don't want it to be known in the town that he and I corresponded as much as all that. After all, there are some things. Just then, and while Brent was beginning to speculate on this suddenly revealed desire for secrecy, a movement in the crowd ahead of them showed that the doors of the moot hall had been thrown open. He too moved forward, drawing his companion with him. "'You'll not forget that,' said Mrs. Saumarez insistently. "'It's those letters, I mean. They're nothing to do with this, of course. Nothing. Don't let it out that—' "'I shan't volunteer any evidence of any sort,' responded Brent. If I'm confronted with a direct question, which necessitates a direct answer, that's another matter. But I don't think you've anything to worry about. I should say that what they want you for is to ask a question or two as to my cousin's movements that night. Didn't he call at your house on his way to the mayor's parlour? Yes, why, that'll be about it. I hope so, said Mrs. Saumarez, with a sigh of relief. But that witness-box, and before all those people— I don't like it. Got to be done, observed Brent. Soon over, though. Now, let's get in. He piloted Mrs. Saumarez and her companion into the borough court, handed over to the coroner for the special purposes of his inquest, found them seats in the reserved part, and leaving them went over to the solicitor's table, where he took a place by the side of Tansley, already settled there with his notes and papers. Tansley gave him a significant glance, nodding his head sideways at other men near them. "'Going to be a more serious affair, this, than the first was, Brent,' he whispered. "'These police chaps have either got something up their sleeves, or Hawthwaite's got some bee in his bonnet. Anyway, there's a barrister in this case on their behalf. That little keen-eyed chap at the far end of the table on your left. That's Meeking, one of the sharpest criminal barristers going.' and I hear they're meaning to call a lot of new witnesses. But what it's all about, I don't know. Brent looked up and down the table at which they were sitting. There were men there, legal-looking men, whom he had not seen at the opening day's proceedings. Who are these other fellows? he asked. Oh, well, Crude's got a man representing his interests, replied Tansley, and there's another solicitor watching the case on behalf of the corporation and I rather fancy that that chap at the extreme end of the table is representing the Treasury, which may mean that this affair is going to be taken up at headquarters. But we know nothing till the cards are on the board. Hawthwaite looks important enough this morning to hold all the aces. Brent glanced at the superintendent, who was exchanging whispers with the coroner's officer, and from him to the crowded seats that ran round three sides of the court. All the notabilities of Hathelsborough were there again in full force. Simon Crude, in a seat of honour, as befitted his due dignity of mayor. Mallet, Coppinger, anybody and everybody of consequence. And there, too, was Crevin Crude and Queenie, and just behind Mrs. Saumarez, Dr. Wellesley, looking distinctly bored, and his assistant, Dr. Carstairs, a young Scotsman, and near them another medical man, Dr. Barber and near the witness-box were several men whom Brent knew by sight as townsmen, and who were obviously expecting to be called for testimony. He turned away, wondering what was to come out of all this. Once more the coroner, precise and formal as ever, took his seat. Once more the twelve jurymen settled in their places, and while Brent was speculating on the first order of procedure, he was startled by the sharp official voice of the coroner's officer. Mrs. Anita Saumarez. Brent heard Tansley smother an exclamation of surprise. A murmur that was not smothered ran round the crowded benches behind him. There was something dramatic in the sudden calling of the pretty young widow, whose personality was still more or less of a mystery to Hathelsborough folk, and something curiosity-raising in the mere fact that she was called. All eyes were on her, as, showing traces of confusion and dislike, she made her way to the witness-box. There was delay then. Mrs. Saumarez had to be instructed to lift her veil and remove her right-hand glove. This gave the crowd abundant opportunity for observing that her usually bright complexion had paled, and that she was obviously ill at ease. 
it was with much embarrassment and in a very low voice that she replied to the preliminary questions anita saumarez widow of the late captain roderick francis saumarez has been resident at the abbey house hathelsborough for about two years doesn't like this job whispered tansley to brent queer from what i've seen of her i should have said she'd make a very good and self-possessed witness but she's nervous old seagrave will have to tackle her gently the coroner evidently realized this as much as tansley did he leaned forward confidentially from his desk toying with his spectacles and regarded the witness with an encouraging and paternal smile mrs saumarez he began we want to ask you a few questions questions your replies to which may perhaps give us a little light on this very sad matter i believe i am right in thinking that you and the late mr wallingford were personal friends mrs saumarez's answer came in low tones and in one word yes very close friends i believe yes he used to visit at your house a great deal yes dine with you i think once or twice a week at one time yes you say at one time when was that period now mrs saumarez who up to this had kept her eyes on the ledge of the witness box began to take courage she lifted them towards the coroner and encountering his placidly benevolent gaze let them remain there well she replied from about the time he became mayor until the time of his death regularly yes regularly we may take it then that you were fond of each other's society mrs saumarez hesitated he was a very interesting man she said at last i liked to talk to him the coroner bent a little nearer well now a more personal question he said suavely you will see the importance of it mr wallingford was constantly visiting you i want a plain answer to what i am going to ask you was he a suitor for your hand mrs saumarez's cheeks flushed and she looked down at the ungloved hand which rested pressed on its gloved fellow on the ledge before her he certainly asked me to marry him she murmured when was that not not long before his death and i'm afraid i must ask you what was your answer i refused his offer did that make any difference to your friendship it hadn't done up to the time of his death he still visited you yes just as often the coroner remained silent for a moment glancing at his notes when he looked towards the witness again he was blander than ever now i shall have to ask you still more personal questions he said it is as you must be aware mrs saumarez well known in the town that on your first coming here as a resident you became on terms of great friendship with dr wellesley do you agree to that yes i suppose so you used to go out a great deal with dr wellesley driving and so on yes in fact dr wellesley at that time paid you great attention yes did those attentions cease about the time that you became so friendly with mr wallingford well they didn't altogether cease but shall we say fell off mrs saumarez hesitated obviously disliking the question i have always been friends with dr wellesley she said eventually all the same has your friendship with him been quite what it was originally since you became so very friendly with the late mayor well perhaps not will you give me a plain answer to this question was there any jealousy aroused between dr wellesley and mr wallingford because of you this time mrs saumarez took a long time to answer she seemed to be thinking reflecting and when she replied it was only to question the coroner am i obliged to answer that she asked i am afraid i must press for an answer said the coroner it is important i think there was jealousy she replied in a low voice on whose part dr wellesley thought i had thrown him over for mr wallingford had dr wellesley ever asked you to marry him 
Mrs. Somarez's answer came with unexpected swiftness. Oh, yes, two or three times. Had you refused him also, then? Mrs. Somarez paused. Her cheeks flushed a deeper red. The fact was, I didn't want to marry anybody, just then, anyway, she answered. They both asked me several times. I, if you please, will you not ask me any more about my private affairs? They've nothing to do with this. It wasn't my fault that those two were jealous of each other, and— She's let the cat out of the bag now, whispered Tansley to Brent. Gad, I see how this thing's going to develop. Whew! Well, there she goes. For the coroner had politely motioned Mrs. Somarez away from the box, and the next instant the official voice rapped out another name. Dr. Rutherford Carstairs. End of chapter 10Chapter Eleven of the Mayor's Parlor by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nineteen Minutes Interval. Carstairs, a red-haired, blue-eyed, stolid-faced young Scotsman, stepped into the witness box with the air of a man who was being forced against his will to the performance of some distasteful obligation. Everybody looked wonderingly at him. He was a comparative stranger in the town and the unimaginative folk amongst the spectators were already cudgelling their brains for an explanation of his presence. But Brent, after a glance at Carstairs, transferred his attention to Carstairs' principal, at whom he had already looked once or twice during Mrs. Somarez's brief occupancy of the witness-box. Wellesley, sitting in a corner seat a little to the rear of the solicitor's table, had manifested some signs of surprise and annoyance, while Mrs. Sawbarez was being questioned. Now he showed blank wonder at hearing his assistant called. He looked from Carstairs to the coroner, and from the coroner to Hawthwaite, and suddenly, while Carstairs was taking an oath, he slipped from his seat, approached Cotman, a local solicitor who sat listening, close by Tansley, and began to talk to him in hurried undertones. Tansley nudged Brent's elbow. "'Wellesley's tumbled to it,' he whispered. "'The police suspect him.' "'Good heavens!' muttered Brent, utterly unprepared for this suggestion. "'You really think that?' "'Dead sure,' asserted Tansley. "'That's the theory. "'What's this red-headed chap called for else? "'You listen.' Brent was listening keenly enough. The witness was giving an account of himself. Robert Carstairs, qualified medical practitioner, qualification specified, at present assistant to Dr. Wellesley, been with him three months. Dr. Carstairs, began the coroner, do you remember the evening on which the late mayor, Mr. Wallingford, was found dead in the mayor's parlour? I do, replied Carstairs bluntly. Where were you on that evening? In the surgery. What are your surgery hours at Dr. Wellesley's? nine to ten of a morning seven to nine of an evening was dr wellesley with you in the surgery on that particular evening he was some of the time not all the time no what part of the time was he there with you he was there with me from seven o'clock until half past seven attending to patients i suppose uh, there were patients three or four do you remember who they were not particularly. Their names will be in the book. Just ordinary callers? Just that. You say Dr. Wellesley was there until half-past seven. What happened then? He went out of the surgery. Uh, do you mean out of the house? I mean what I say, out of the surgery. Where is the surgery situated? At the back of the house, behind the dining room. There's a way into it from St. Lawrence Lane. That's the way the patients come in. Did Dr. Wellesley go out that way, or did he go into the house? I don't know where he went. All I know is he went, leaving me there. Didn't say where he was going? He didn't say anything. Was he dressed for going out? No, he was wearing a white linen jacket, such as we always wear at surgery hours. And that was at half-past seven? Half-past seven precisely. How do you fix the time? There's a big old-fashioned clock in the surgery. 
Just as Dr. Wellesley went out, I heard the Moot Hall clock chime half-past seven, and then the chimes of St. Hathelwood's Church. I noticed that our clock was a couple of minutes slow, and I put it right. When did you next see Dr. Wellesley? At just eleven minutes to eight. Where? In the surgery. He came back there. Yes. How do you fix that precise time, eleven minutes to eight? Because he'd arranged to see a patient at Meadowgate at ten minutes to eight. I glanced at the clock as he came in, saw what time it was, and reminded him of the appointment. Did he go to keep it? He did. Was he still wearing the white linen jacket when he came back to you? Yes, he took it off, then put on his coat and hat, and went out again. According to what you say, he was out of the surgery, wearing that white linen jacket exactly nineteen minutes. Did he say anything to you when he came back at eleven minutes to eight, of where he had been, or what he had been doing during the interval between seven-thirty and seven-forty-nine? He said nothing. You concluded that he had been in the house? I concluded nothing. I never even thought about it. But I certainly shouldn't have thought that he would go out into the street in his surgery jacket. Well, Dr. Wellesley went out at 7.50 to see this patient at Meadowgate. Did anything unusual happen after that, in the surgery, I mean? Nothing, until a little after eight. Then a policeman came for Dr. Wellesley, saying that the mayor had been found dead in his parlour, and that it looked like murder. I sent him to find Dr. Wellesley in Meadowgate, told him where he was. You didn't go to the moot hall yourself? No, there were patients in the surgery. The coroner paused in his questioning, glanced at his papers, and then nodded to the witness as an intimation that he had nothing further to ask him. And Carstairs was about to step down from the box when Cotman, the solicitor to whom Wellesley had been whispering, rose quickly from his seat and turned towards the coroner. "'Before this witness leaves the box, sir,' he said, "'I should like to ask him two or three questions. "'I am instructed by Dr. Wellesley to appear for him. "'Dr. Wellesley, since you resume this inquest, sir, "'learns with surprise, and yes, I will say with disgust, "'for strong word though it is, it is strictly applicable, "'that all unknown to him the police hold him suspect "'and are endeavouring to fasten the crime of murder on him.' In fact, sir, I cannot sufficiently express my condemnation of the methods which have evidently been resorted to in underhand fashion. The coroner waved a deprecating hand. Yes, yes, he said, but we are here, Mr. Cotman, to hold a full inquiry into the circumstances of the death of the late mayor, and the police, or anybody else, as you know very well, are fully entitled to pursue any course they choose in the effort to get at the truth just as you are entitled to ask any questions of any witness, to be sure. You wish to question the present witness. I shall exercise my right to question this and any other witness, sir, replied Cotman. He turned to Carstairs, who had lingered in the witness box during the exchange between coroner and solicitor. Dr. Carstairs, he continued, you say that after being away from his surgery for nineteen minutes, on the evening of Mr. Wallingford's death, Dr. Wellesley came back to you there? Yes, answered Carstairs, that's so. Was anyone with you in the surgery when he returned? No, no one. You were alone with him until he went out again to the appointment in Meadowgate? Yes, quite alone. So you had abundant opportunity of observing him. Did he seem at all excited, flurried? Did you notice anything unusual in his manner? I didn't. He was just himself. Quite calm and normal? Oh, quite. Didn't give you the impression that he'd just been going through any particular moving or trying episode, such as murdering a fellow creature? He didn't, replied Carstairs, without the ghost of a smile. He was just as usual. When did you see him next, after he went out to keep the appointment at Meadow Gate? About half-past eight, or a little later. Where? At the mortuary. He sent for me. I went to the mortuary and found him there with Dr. Barber. They were making an examination of the dead man and wanted my help. Was Dr. Wellesley excited or upset then? 
he was not he seemed to me i'm speaking professionally mind you remarkably cool cotman suddenly sat down and turned to his client with a smile on his lips evidently he made some cynical remark to wellesley for wellesley smiled too smart chap cotman whispered tansley to brent that bit of cross-exam will tell with the jury and now what next bunning recalled from the previous sitting came next merely to repeat that the mayor went up to his parlour at twenty-five minutes past seven and that he and mr brent found his worship dead just after eight o'clock Following him came Dr. Barber, who testified that when he first saw Wallingford's dead body, just about a quarter past eight, he came to the conclusion that death had taken place about forty-five minutes previously, perhaps a little less. And from him, Cotman drew evidence that Wellesley, in the examination at the mortuary, was normal, calm, collected, and, added Dr. Barber of his own will, greatly annoyed and horrified at the murder. Brent was beginning to get sick of this new development. To him it seemed idle and purposeless. He whispered as much to Tansley, but Tansley shook his head. "'Can't say that,' he replied. "'Where was Wellesley during that nineteen minutes' absence from the surgery? He'll have to explain that, anyway. But they'll have more evidence than what we've heard. Hello, here's Walkershaw, the borough surveyor. What are they going to get out of him, I wonder?' Brent watched an official-looking person make his way to the witness-box. He was armed with a quantity of rolls of drawing-paper, and a clerk accompanied him whose duty, it presently appeared, was to act as a living easel and hold up these things, diagrams and outlines, while his principal explained them. Presently the eager audience found itself listening to what was neither more nor less than a lecture on the architecture of Hathelsborough Moot Hall, and its immediately adjacent buildings, and then Brent began to see the drift of the borough surveyor's evidence. The whole block of masonry between Copper Alley and Piper's Passage testified Walkershaw, illustrating his observations by pointing to the large diagram held on high by his clerk, was extremely ancient. In it there were three separate buildings, separate that was in their use, but all joining on to each other. First, next to Copper Alley, which ran out of Meadowgate, came the big house long used as a bank. Then came the Moot Hall itself. Next, between the Moot Hall and Piper's Passage, which was a narrow entry between Rivergate and St. Lawrence Lane, stood Dr. Wellesley's house. And between it and the Moot Hall there was a definite means of communication, in short, a private door. There was a general pricking of ears upon this announcement, and Tansley indulged in a low whistle. He saw the significance of Walkershaw's statement. "'Another link in the chain, Brent,' he muttered. "'Pop, my word, they're putting it together rather cleverly. Nineteen minutes' absence, door between his house and the boot hall, come!' Brent made no comment. He was closely following the borough surveyor, as that worthy pointed out on his plans and diagrams, the means of communication between the moot hall and the old dwelling-place at its side. In former days, said Walkershaw, some mayor of Hathelsborough had caused a door to be made in a certain small room in the house. That door opened on a passage in the moot hall, which led to the corridor wherein the mayor's parlour was situated. It had no doubt been used by many occupants of the mayoral chain during their term of office. Of late, however, nobody seemed to have known of it, but he himself, having examined it, for the purposes of this inquiry during the last day or two, had found that it showed unmistakable signs of recent usage. In fact, the lock and bolts had been quite recently oiled. The evidence of this witness came to a dramatic end in the shape of a question from the coroner. How long would it take, then, for any person to pass from Dr. Wellesley's house to the mayor's parlour in the Moot Hall? One minute, replied Walkershaw promptly. If anything, less. Cotman, who had been whispering with his client during the borough surveyor's evidence, asked no questions, and presently the interest of the court shifted to a little shrewd-faced, self-possessed woman, who tripped into the witness-box and admitted cheerfully that she was Mrs. Mariner, proprietor of Mariner's Laundry, 
and that she washed for several of the best families in Hathelsborough. The fragment of handkerchief which had been found in the mayor's parlour was handed to her for inspection, and the coroner asked her if she could say definitely if she knew whose it was. There was considerable doubt and scepticism in his voice as he put the question, but Mrs. Mariner showed herself the incarnation of sure and positive conviction. "'Yes, sir,' she answered. "'It's Dr. Wellesley's.' "'You must wash a great many handkerchiefs at your laundry, Mrs. Mariner,' observed the coroner. "'How can you be sure about one, about that one?' "'I'm sure enough about that one, sir, because it's one of a dozen that's gone through my hands many a time,' asserted Mrs. Mariner. "'There's nobody in the town, sir, leastways not amongst my customers, and I wash for all the very best people, sir, that has any handkerchiefs like them except Dr. Wellesley. They're the finest French cambric. That there is a piece of one of the doctor's best handkerchiefs, sir, as sure as I'm in this here box, which I wish I wasn't.' The coroner asked nothing further. He was still plainly impatient about the handkerchief evidence, if not wholly sceptical, and he waved Mrs. Mariner away. But Cotman stopped her. "'I suppose, Mrs. Mariner, that mistakes are sometimes made when you and your assistants send home the clean clothes,' he suggested. "'Things get in the wrong baskets, eh?' "'Well, not often at my place, sir,' replied Mrs. Mariner. "'We're very particular.' still sometimes you know oh i'll not say that they don't sometimes sir admitted mrs mariner we're all of us human creatures as you're very well aware sir this particular handkerchief may have got into a wrong basket urged cotman it's possible oh it's possible sir said mrs mariner mistakes will happen sir mrs mariner disappeared amongst the crowd and a new witness took her place she too was a woman and a young and pretty one and in a tearful and nervous condition tansley glanced at her and turned with a significant glance to brent great scott he whispered wellesley's housemaid End of chapter eleven